All right. Uh, welcome everybody to this, our uh, community discussion on neurodiversity in XR. Uh, I'm Dylan Fox, I'm the, the Director of Operations for XR Access uh, at Cornell. Um, Pierce, you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, hey everyone, thanks for joining in today. Uh, my name is Pierce. I'm the Senior Manager over Research and Best Practices at XR Association. Uh, XR Access and XRA put together a, uh, uh, or have put together an ongoing series of community discussions to dive into a targeted topic related to accessibility. In the past, we've done spatial audio and haptic feedback amongst a few others. And today we are gonna be focusing in on neurodiversity and how immersive tech can help those who are neurodivergent uh, to develop social skills and you know uh, how immersive tech can help with therapeutic interventions and motor skills and coordination um, and all other topics that we can um, and other topics that we can figure out. Uh, Dylan, back to you. Yeah, yeah. And I think a big thing is we want to make sure we capture the barriers that neurodiverse what people face. Ah, oh, there you go. Uh, the barriers that that people face uh, who are neurodiverse and using XR um, and how we can make uh, XR as a whole more inclusive to those people and to everybody. Um, so the format for today is we're going to have uh, uh, start with uh, 10 minute talks from each of our uh, three featured speakers here. Um, we have Jasmine Collins from Cornell, uh, Kate Kalsevich from Fable, and uh, Olga Ivanova from VR Oxygen. Um, and then after that, we are going to open it up and have a, a general discussion because we know that nobody has all of the answers uh, when it comes to XR accessibility. This is still a very new and developing field. Uh, and so our goal with these community discussions is to make sure that you all uh, are not just you know an audience, but are part of the community. Uh, and each of you has expertise uh, that can help us solve some of these problems. Um, and we want to hear from you. This is not intended to be a, you know, the five of us talk yours off for an hour and a half. It's meant to be a conversation uh, between everybody here. So uh, after we get through our, our featured speakers, we're just gonna kind of kick it off. Um, we really do encourage everybody to feel free to turn on your video, uh, you know, turn on uh, your microphone, as long as you're not loading us with background noise um, or just type into chat and, and speak up and contribute to the discussion. Um, so with that said, uh, I think Jasmine, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself uh, and then take it away. Yeah, okay. So hello everyone. So happy to happy to start us off here for our community discussion. Um, do you wanna just double check and make sure, okay, yes, I can share my screen. Share screen. So. Yeah, good. All right. So as a as a forewarning to everyone, I will have some slides, but don't worry. It's not going to be like a big lecture. I don't expect you guys to take notes. There will be no quizzes. Uh, these are purely just to be um, some visual kind of um, aids for you guys for what I'm talking about, some of the images of the kinds of applications that I work with. Um, and I'm just going to use that to share some of the work that I do and some of the work that my lab does. Uh, so first, I'll just put this in slideshow mode. And can you all see my slides? Yep. And uh, I just shared in chat the link to the slides and the link to uh, an alt text document for anybody who needs it. Yes, perfect. OK, great. So just to kind of get started and introduce who I am so that you guys sort of know what angle I'm approaching this discussion from, uh, my name is Jasmine. As Dylan introduced briefly, I am a PhD student researcher at Cornell University as well as Cornell Tech uh, in New York City. And at those different universities, I'm a part of two different research labs that we have there. So the first is the Enhancing Ability Lab, which is focused on accessibility and these sort of like cutting edge technologies like AI and XR. Uh, and the second one is the Virtual Embodiment Lab, which is a lot more focused on virtual reality and different ways that you can represent yourself in virtual reality and how to advance that field. And as a part of both of those labs, I also work with XR Access. I'm part of the kind of research initiative that XR Access has, where we're trying to get some of the academic research publications more out into the rest of the world, kind of share it in more venues and outside of really that sort of bubble of academia space. 
Uh, but in general, the work that I do and the sort of kind of way that I'm coming into this conversation with neurodivergence and XR is very much from the academic side of things, the, the research angle of approaching neurodivergent XR accessibility. And to start us off with that, and just because of that, I'm going to begin my talk with a quick just intro to how academia has historically approached a lot of XR accessibility when it comes to neurodivergent populations. So historically, academia has taken a really big focus with the diagnostic or the rehabilitative approach um, to VR and neurodivergence, um, especially among children. So essentially what we have here is a lot of researchers and studies have found a plethora of ways to just create VR prototypes that are meant to diagnose or identify conditions like ADHD or autism, learning disabilities, many other kinds of neurodivergent conditions. Um, even some of the most recent work that we have in this space, um, as early as 2022, um, comes to us with these really big studies that have gotten a lot of publication oh, 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 oh. when it comes to diagnosing mm -hmm. these conditions. So, for example, on the screen here, I have this image from a study on a VR prototype called Epily. So this was a VR game, um, stood for Executive Performance in Everyday Living. And uh, what you see on the screen here is on the left side of the image, there is a children's bedroom. There's a red dot that's focused on a dragon plushie kind of floating in the middle of that children's bedroom. There's various toys in the background, toy trucks, play mats on the floor, racetracks. Uh, that red dot represents eye gaze, the eye gaze of the user who's playing this game, Epily. And on the right side of the image, there's a heat map that sort of represents how the user's eye gaze has moved throughout the space. There's a cluster that's sort of concentrated where the dragon plushie is, and there's a couple of outliers in other parts of the image. Uh, this game was meant to use eye gaze to diagnose if the children playing it had ADHD based on their eye patterns. So got a lot of press, very big study, very popular study, kind of, kind of par for the course for how people tend to approach neurodivergence and XR. Um, now, this approach can be, you know, very useful. It shows us how we can identify these different conditions. Some of these VR prototypes can even be used to help with certain aspects of those conditions, like, for example, um, a time simulator that helps people with ADHD identify the passing of time and practice time blindness or try to fix time blindness. Uh, however, this does end up kind of with a caveat uh, that in the academia space, um, especially, people don't really tend to think of neurodivergent populations as users of VR. Neurodivergent people end up becoming like patients. They become clients who VR is used kind of exclusively to treat or to diagnose. Um, but neurodivergent people don't exclusively use VR in this sort of rehabilitative way, in this sort of like patient well, no. client way. Uh, I'm ADHD, reality. for example, but every time I use VR, I'm not necessarily trying to hop in a time simulator and fix my time blindness. Sometimes I just want to play these VR games, engage in VR spaces. Um, neurodivergent people can also be users of XR. And that kind of work, that kind of angle is something that my lab likes to focus on. So specifically, we like to focus on XR from the perspective of neurodivergent people as users of those applications. So instead of thinking about neurodivergent people like as patients, we try to think of them as players, you know, people who enter these games, people who enter these experiences. And we try to consider what about those experiences is accessible or inaccessible for those populations currently. And what about those experiences can actually be advantageous over the real world, for example, for neurodivergent populations. Now, namely, one of the big types of applications that we explore um, in VR is a specific type of application called social VR. So these are essentially um, applications where a variety of different users all get together in something that you can kind of think of as an embodied form of the internet. Uh, everyone has an avatar, they join together in these three-dimensional spaces, and they can do activities together, communicate with each other, and move around through this digital virtual world together. It's all very, very social. Uh, now, these applications are also some of the most popular VR applications that are used today. I have two images on the screen that are taken from one example of an application called VR Chat, which many of you, I'm sure, have heard of. So... Uh, on, on the screen just to describe it for anyone who might not be able to see or <laughs> interpret what's inside of these images. 
In the left image that I have here, we have three avatars that are sort of on this uh, disco dance floor in what appears to be a nightclub. There's these colorful laser beams, ring lights, flashing lights in the background of the avatars. Um, all of them are humanoid, but one of them has a what appears to be a toaster for a head with bunny ears. Another one has a hamburger for a head. Um, so very chaotic, very strange there. And on the right side image that we have, I have a sort of plaza at night with a big glowing tree that's in the center of the plaza and a variety of avatars that are gathered around that from a flying robot and a floating like sleeping fox creature to humanoid wolves and a smiling hot dog. Uh, so just from my my attempts to sort of describe the image, I'm sure that you guys can kind of get the idea that there's a lot that goes on in these applications. And a big part of that is that social VR is very user driven as far as the type of application it is. Users create a lot of the content that goes into it. They make their own avatars, they make their own world, they make and build the experience um, that everyone goes in there to, to try out. Now, this is a really cool creative part of social VR, but it does create a potential problem area for neurodivergent users. So for example, um, these, avatar, this, these amateur kind of indie creators of these avatars and worlds aren't necessarily following good UX design principles or sensory design principles. The world on the left that I just described to you guys, that left image with all of its flashing lights and large sound effects would probably be very sensory stimulating or overstimulating to a neurodivergent user. Um, the social situations that you can see in the image on the right, where there's lots of different people um, who can use body language to communicate with each other because they're in embodied avatars. That could bring in all kinds of social challenges that neurodivergent users face in real life, where they might have difficulties interpreting body language, interpreting these kinds of cues that are coming up. Um, but it's all kind of moved into the social VR space. Now, because we have all of these like additional like things to consider, these body language, these sensory issues with social VR, it's kind of a space that one has some potential advantages. It has the advantage that we can control a lot of different aspects of this digital experience, possibly making it more accessible. But two, it has the disadvantages that in its state right now, people don't really make it accessible. It kind of is a very chaotic space currently. Uh, so my lab likes to examine these applications. We like to see what's inaccessible, what's accessible about them right now, and how neurodivergent users experience them. And then to kind of just move on to this last visual that I have here for you guys, um, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the work that's come out of our examinations here. So we've examined a lot of different things um, for social VR applications, anything from avatar customization to the best ways to bring in real life accommodations into the VR space to just how people like feel and experience the VR itself in general. So on the left side of the screen here, I actually have a sketch that was from one of our previous studies on inclusive uh, invisible disability representation um, to give you an idea of how some people wanted to be able to represent invisible disabilities, including neurodivergent conditions in virtual reality. So it sort of shows this um, avatar that's been sketched out. There's like a custom t-shirt on them. It's zebra striped in order to represent rare diseases. There's a giant spoon that they're holding, which is meant to represent spoon theory that often comes up in the neurodivergent space. Um, and there's a variety of other little bubbles and fun facts about their condition and things to kind of spread awareness of their conditions that this user wanted to have. So that kind of just a snapshot of the potential for customization of avatars in this space. Um, we've also found in some of our previous studies uh, that users want to be able to bring in real life accommodations into the VR space. And we've also found some interesting ways that those real life accommodations can be improved or enhanced in VR. So for example, when a person wants to go nonverbal instead of you know, speaking verbally using voice chat in virtual reality, rather than just um, not talking, they could have, for example, the system talk for them. So this virtual system can actually voice whatever it is they want to say without them having to actually say it themselves. Or if they have noise canceling headphones, as opposed to just muffling the world around them, it can completely silence things. 
Uh, so we've discussed this at length with different participants that we've had, different theories that we've, um, or different studies that we've run. So we've we've kind of have this huge array um, of discussions on customization of avatars, ways to make VR more accessible, accommodations that can be improved in virtual reality, and a lot of other just really fascinating, rich discussions on social VR and its accessibility right now. Now, all that, I think, is pretty much the wrap up of what I wanted to just kick off for you guys. So I'm excited to dive into some of these topics more in our community discussion that's going to come later. If anyone wants to contact me after this discussion is over, I have my contact information on screen. You can find me on LinkedIn just by looking up my name, Jasmine Collins. It is not spelled the typical way. So I am the first one who will come up there if you spell Jasmine like my name. Uh, and you can also reach out to me at my email. Uh, which is linked there. So thanks for listening. And I'm excited to hear the other speakers. Awesome. Thanks. That was great, Jasmine. Um, if anyone does have any questions following Jasmine's presentation, please either uh, hold them until after the presentations are all done or feel free to drop them in the chat and we can um, ask them after um, everyone else goes. Uh, next, I wanted to introduce Olga. Uh, Olga, take it away. Uh, thank you, Pierce. Uh, and thank you, Jasmine. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, let me share my screen first. Okay, you can see my screen, right? I think so. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so uh, to introduce myself, um, I'm Olga, the founder of VR Oxygen, a VR native user research platform standardizing uh, VR uh, user testing process. Uh, VR Oxygen helps find VR users for accessibility and user testing and provides VR native tools to uh, and solutions to, pro to conduct uh, testing uh, res and research remotely. I've been active in VR since 2014 as a community builder, uh, game developer, and product leader. And I created a heuristic evaluation tool before the Oculus VRCs existed. Uh, among my contributions to VR communities was um, sharing my expertise with Meta that can be found um, on a uh, Oculus developer website as a VR place testing guide. And I have spoken about user testing and accessibility at South by Southwest, Berkeley Infocom, Cascade SF, and SFVR. And I'll be talking about the uh, how VR uh, experiences can better cater to specifically AD users with ADHD um, and the main topics uh, will be, oh, actually, sorry, I didn't do this uh, slide, slideshow, slideshow like this. Um, I'll cover understanding uh, neurodiverse VR users with ADHD specifically, finding um, uh, fi our findings from testing, games and applications with users with ADHD and design strategies on how to make applications more accessible for these specific users. So first let's clarify uh, what uh, ADHD means. Uh, it's the most common type of um, neurodivergence that affects uh, how people process information, focus, and interact with environments, whether real or digital. And it's important to note that there are multiple types of ADHD, uh, for example, overfocused uh, when people tend uh, or have difficulties switching from uh, tasks, uh, anxious, uh, inattentive, uh, which is counted as classic, hyperactive, uh, limbic, that's often low energy or socially isol isolated. Uh, and there are multiple others. Um, and often these types come with comorbidities like tics or fidgeting, um, learning disabilities, anxiety. And in VR, this uh, translates into unique preferences and uh, challenges such as um, sensory sensitivity, attention span, interaction, And uh, the findings I'll be sharing are from testing sessions on our platform involving 
in our behavioral analysis from video recordings, live streams, interviews, combined with data about um, general VR users, uh, about uh, life, regular life habits, preferences. And it's interesting that the feedback can be contradicting uh, for ADHD users with different types. Um, so one recurring theme was uh, sensory, sensory sensitivity, uh, specifically sensitivity to noise and visuals. Uh, on one hand, um, people uh, were very sensitive to the sounds. On the other hand, for example, inattentive uh, ADHD users with um, uh, specifically inattentive and anxious, they valued balanced audio and they, they found it calming. Um, so there is a need for sensor, sensor, sensory control. And the majority of ADHD users noted that uh, it's important to match music to the environment and to the context and ensure that it's not distracting. And in general, noisy and chaotic environments were uh, overwhelming. Uh, as well, uh, people with ADHD uh, may experience difficulties in maintaining focus in the moment. And there might be differences between different types. For example, the over-focused over users tend to become deeply immersed uh, on the tasks or gameplay and they can stay engaged for hours or play the game for hours um, if the game continues or has challenges. And anxious and inattentive users, in contrast, uh, struggle with attention consistency. Uh, while they can become immersed in VR, they are most likely to lose focus if the game doesn't have uh, a storyline um, or specific stimulating yeah, or more, more or less stimulating environment. And they take breaks more regularly than people with overfocused ADHD. Um, also another uh, uh, thing to note is that uh, overfocused um, ADHD users wanted more freedom to explore the mechanics of the game or app on their own, uh, or at least to have an opportunity to skip or pause the tutorial, while users with inattentive or anxious ADHD, they preferred to still have the tutorial and they wanted to get back to it when they needed or when they came back from a break, for example. Uh, tasks uh, is a big motivator in itself for ADHD players and users. Um, <clears throat> uh, in general, apps that balance challenge with immersive immediate uh, feedback, uh, for example, reward or uh, unlocking the next level, uh, getting special uh, superpowers can very effectively keep ADHD users engaged. Uh, and immersion itself helps to hold focus for people with ADHD. The overfocused users, as I mentioned, uh, can use or can play a game for hours. And it's interesting that they don't, uh, they sometimes play until the headset loses power, while the inattentive users mentioned that if something is doesn't interest them in the game or app, they may feel all kinds of uncomfortable things. Uh, not only in the app, but also the weight of a headset, and they may want to take a break more frequently. Um, for, in a, for users with uh, inattentive um, and anxious ADHD, a good uh, way to hold their focus is a clear uh, and interesting storyline. Um, while overfocused users uh, mentioned that the main uh, option to keep their focus is actually having clear tasks with a reward system 
and they like exploring environments on their own. Uh, autonomy, uh, in terms of autonomy and control, uh, yeah, as I, I just mentioned, overfocused like exploring immersive experiences uh, by themselves, uh, skip tutorials and on the onboarding processes and attentive like um, in general, uh, the opposite. They like having freedom as well, but they tend to get back to tutorials more often and tend to uh, uh, when they have a break, tend to forget what uh, features or what options were available or where they were in the app. So they need some cues or hints or map to easily access the uh, information where they were before. In terms of social in uh, interactions, as uh, Jasmine mentioned, uh, they experience all uh, Users we talked to, they experienced um, uh, some type of anxiety, and they preferred single player modes over multiplayer. Uh, if talked specifically about types of uh, ADHD or focused uh, ADHD users, they prefer they sometimes uh, went and used multiplayer options, but they preferred to use it with their friends. So they uh, they do play multiplayers, but primarily with their with their uh, friends or people they already know. And ADHD users with anxious or inattentive ADHD tend to not use multiplayers at all. And in terms of gameplay, gameplay, um, while over focused users uh, skip tutorials and prefer fast paced games, they users with anxious and inattentive ADHD often prefer slower types of games and story-driven experiences. So next I want to talk about strategies on how to make um, VR experiences more accessible for users with ADHD and some evaluation methods. First, uh, adjustable sensory inputs. Uh, for example, having the ability to adjust sound settings, music sound, uh, sound effects, special effects, cues, hints, voices, adjust different noises, for example, crowd noises, mute or mute specific uh, people or users. Adjusting colors, uh, dim uh, some colors or making them more bright. Um, yeah, customizable game mechanics, options to skip tutorials, turn the hints on and off to enable more autonomy and on-demand assistance whenever needed. Tailor the difficulty settings, um, adapt uh, task complexity. Also want to mention that in some cases, free customizations might be overwhelming by themselves. So having presets can be a solution, for example, preset for focus with no noise, muted, social sound, high contrast. And as addition, as an addition, uh, offering more customization for contrast, brightness, and saturation. And also it's important to explore viewing accessibility settings multidimensionally. For example, high contrast mode can benefit low vision users and not only people with ADHD. So if we think more broadly, it can help expand the audience. So while a feature may have they're primarily a target audience or target user. Uh, it can be, so with, with this example, um, the contrast mode can not only help users with, with low vision, <clears throat> but also help aid focus people with ADHD. And it will help with um, 
information clarity for these types of users. And accessibility for users with ADHD can be evaluated through testing with user, users with ADHD. It's important to choose methodology uh, in order to avoid cognitive load and distractions. For example, if there is a need to remember tasks or the need to remember to remember what people need to, to do, it can be very distracting. Uh, and can people may have a wrong impression from the app itself. So it's better to provide, if there are no other options, it's better to provide clear guidance on how to conduct uh, the test. Uh, also, another thing I wanted to mention is, yes, aim for aim to test in the environment they are familiar with or uh, environment they would naturally use the app in whether it's a game or workplace app. So uh, it's natural for them to use it. And as an option, it can be live stream uh, with observers or video recording. And regardless of the method, it's important not only, it's important to do uh, all together uh, observing the player behavior uh, gathering their feedback and analyzing everything all together because sometimes it can be contradicting. So the combination of both uh, is needed. Um, yeah, so testing is important to enable everyone to participate. And for example, tools, uh, if there are any tools in the workplace, even if they are not required to use to be used by everyone, it's better to have them accessible for everyone and to be to also be compliant. I think those are um, yeah, those are main things I wanted to share. And about scoring um, and compliance. Uh, we are building standards based on the previous tests. So whenever you conduct testing, always compare to your previous find findings to see the progression and uh, changes. I think, yeah, those are, if you want to contact me, here are my, uh, there's my email and you can find me on LinkedIn also by searching and adding their oxygen. Awesome. Thanks Thank so much, you. Olga. Thank you. Yeah, definitely some some excellent uh, tips and lessons there. Um, and now uh, I think go ahead and like to uh, pass it to our final featured speaker, um, Kate. Please introduce yourself and uh, take it away. Thanks. And I don't have any slides. Um, you can spotlight me, or we can just uh, go back to non sharing mode and and uh, do it that way. Um, so my name is Kate Kelsvich, and I am the head of accessibility innovation at a company called Fable. And of all the uh, panelists here, I probably have the least experience with XR, but I have a ton of experience working with people with disabilities, um, either through my company Fable, and also just as a manager and a leader in the workforce. So I'm gonna talk about it from that perspective. Um, I have been in the field of web accessibility since 2001, so a little over two decades focused on that. Um, I actually started my career as a practitioner in user experience and front-end development, um, so actually building websites and making sure that they were accessible. And then I moved into a leadership role about 15 years ago. I identify as disabled, and I wear hearing aids in both of my ears. They're super tiny. Um, so it somewhat qualifies as an invisible disability, as most neurodiversity does. So I, I relate, <laughs> even though I don't have that disability, I do relate to having an invisible disability. Um, and most of my experience lies with usability testing of applications with assistive technology users. 
primarily on web and mobile, but also a bit of TV accessibility as well. And I've also managed a lot of people who identify or sometimes don't identify as neurodivergent, but definitely are neurodiverse. Um, and I also am the co-chair of Fable's Cognitive Accessibility Working Group. So I, I've done a decent amount of thinking about neurodiversity, especially as it relates to productivity and communication and helping people to be successful. And so a little bit about Fable. Fable is a company that helps large organizations uh, with on-demand accessibility testing and research with people with disabilities. So that's where a lot of my experiences working with people who use assistive technology come from. And some of those users have multiple disabilities, including cognitive disabilities or neurodiversity. Um, and we also do uh, accessibility training through our upskill products. So I um, want to the parts of my role is to develop curriculum for training people on accessibility. So that's a bit about my background. I wanted to talk about the challenges with identity. And when we talk about XR and how we might support people who are uh, neurodivergent in XR, I think it's important to recognize that not everybody has been diagnosed or even identifies. So more formally, we think about neurodiversity as having learning disabilities or any kind of challenge around learning, focus and attention. Um, oftentimes there are communication challenges, whether it's um, taking in information or also communicating to others. So it goes both ways. The challenge is sometimes with reasoning and this big bucket just called executive function. And I really struggle with executive function. Like, what does that mean? I have to keep looking it up and reminding myself because it just feels like such a catch-all for all of these different things. So what I I like to break it down as um, the ability to hold something in memory and being able to um, take that piece of information and use it. So that can be planning, um, time management, um, you know, just being able to store and retrieve information that's being given to you, having cognitive flexibility, so being able to switch between tasks, like multitask effectively, thinking about more than one thing at once or contradictory things, or also being able to think about the same thing from different perspectives can be really hard, and that can lead to some of the communication and social, social challenges that people have. And then there's controlling your inhibitions, your emotional responses, um, you know, just being able to respond appropriately to social cues, to be able to recognize social cues. Um, and then there's just maintaining your concentration and focus on single task as well. So executive function covers so many different things. And I think a lot of times um, with neurodiversity, when you're managing and trying to help people succeed in the workplace, it can be tough because sometimes people come with a diagnosis and they, you know, know that they're they are neurodivergent, and other people don't know. Um, and so, it can be tough, especially if, as an adult, if you haven't been diagnosed as a child, it can be difficult to get a diagnosis as an adult. Um, so, I've actually managed a lot of people who maybe didn't have a diagnosis. I mean, some who did, and some who didn't. Um, and especially hard for women to get a diagnosis of certain things like autism. Um, and ADHD that tend to be diagnosed more in young boys than they are in adult women. And so sometimes people will self-diagnose, like they'll just say, I know these things are hard for me. Um, or as a manager who's paying attention to the needs of the people who report to you or um, just your coworkers and people in the organization, you can sometimes just come to the conclusion that people need certain support. And so I'll talk a bit about what those kinds of supports are, and then I'm going to go into how XR. I'm going to bring it back to XR at the end. Don't worry. Um, but I just want to talk about like what are the challenges that I've seen. And so this is not based on research studies or anything like that. This is just my personal experience in like my last 15 years of, of leading teams that were very diverse teams. Um, a lot of times, people might have challenges with their coworker relationships. Um, and so sometimes as a manager, I have to step in and help repair relationships because people, you know, aren't aware of why that relationship has been 
damaged or what caused it to be damaged or even possibly aware that you know other people in the workspace have certain feelings about them or or avoid working with them so um, when you don't have that perception of social cues and understanding of those interactions sometimes um, as an ally to people who are neurodivergent I see my role sometimes to help facilitate that and especially if people have challenges with understanding other perspectives, when we think of that executive function, can I only see things my way or can I, you know, place myself in somebody else's uh, position and try to see things from their perspective? If you can't do that, it can be really hard to sort through some of the um, challenges you might have with coworkers. And so the other thing I see people needing is different forms of communication. So, um, in a remote first world, which I feel like a lot of places are bringing people back into the workplace, but still a lot of us are remote, chat can be one of the biggest distractions. You know, that constant interruption of messages and ask for this and that. And if you don't have the ability um, to control those distractions and stop you, like your entire day can be just swept away by having to keep an eye on chat messages. So there's this tension between needing to be responsive to the needs of other people in the organization, but like being unable to focus with that constant stream of distraction. So whether there are technical solutions to that, or, you know, people just need to have a status message saying, I only check chat during these two hours every day, and they literally need to be logged off the rest of the time, the kind of thing. There are lots of ways to work around that. Um, people might struggle with long form written content, which is, you know, where augmented reality and, and virtual reality and stuff where everything transitioned to a much more visual and auditory experience can be really helpful. Um, and then there's just communication when it comes to eye contact, body language, sarcasm, jokes, all the things that are part of navigating human relationships that can be hard for people who are neurodivergent. Um, and then there's a physical space, open spaces. I've had people working for me in open spaces where like there was just so much challenge with distraction of people even walking or just being in the same space. Any kind of movement can be distracting. Um, at one point we had to build a like temporary wall to help somebody, even though they were in an open space, just kind of like block everything physically behind them. Um, there's the issue of overhead lighting and indirect lighting that can be really challenging for some people where bright light can be um, triggering migraines or things like that, or like a flickering if it's a fluorescent light. And then there might just not be a setup in a physical space for optimal productivity. You know, people might need to be creative and have a whiteboard. And if you don't have that in your space, so that's another area where XR could potentially step in and provide a virtual whiteboard or even some sort of augmented reality where you can whip out your phone and, you know, try to work with a space in a way that is not set up for, um, but that you can customize for what you need. And so the last thing when it comes to spaces is some people do really well um, around other people and they find it hard to work when they're alone. They need that like social, we're all in the office together, working together. Um, and sometimes setting up virtual uh, Zoom rooms or Teams rooms where people just hang out and co-work together can help in that remote world versus other people just prefer isolation. And that idea of being able to work from home and work remotely really helps them with their productivity. And so when it comes to productivity as a manager, working with people who are neurodivergent, um, oftentimes you have to provide extra support for just making decisions, prioritizing the task and the activities to work on, or maybe providing supports with memory as well. And that can be done through software. Um, software can help a lot with time management, task management, helping with writing tone. You know, if people are writing emails and not knowing how to position that email. Um, AI is really great for that. And it can also help with just creative thinking as well. Um, and then fidget spinners. I'm actually holding a fidget spinner right now. Um, it's a little disc and it's spinning around. And a lot of people who are neurodivergent uh, find it helpful to have things like that. I don't know why I do. I just, I have, I have another one. It's a floppy pen with a, like a little leaf and a ladybug on the end of it. And I just like to hold these things and, and fidget with them. So 
Um, there are things I have learned from my neurodivergent employees that I find useful for focus and attention. And then there's some really cool products. It's a compression vest. And now I've seen those. Um, so my first experiences with compression breaths were working in a vet clinic when I was younger and they would use them on cats and dogs to calm them down. Um, but now they're also used in children who are neurodivergent to, you know, give them a sense of comfort and control almost. And I've seen a product uh, recently released in Canada for adults, which is a sensory vest and it just provides adjustable levels of compression. So I think a lot of really cool things. Um, and so how can XR help with all of these challenges? Well, certainly the ability to adapt test-based content into other formats in real time. So maybe having um, your phone and pointing it at a sheet of paper and then having an avatar read that out to you, you know, as if it was a person speaking to you or something like that, or, you know, being able to do that with a headset, if not your phone. Um, having some sort of glasses, like whether that's a full VR uh, headset or some sort of digital glasses, just to mask the eye gaze can help. So for people who don't like to hold eye contact, that can be uncomfortable for others. So, you know, kind of masking that or even using that at the same time to provide cues on emotion. So if you're somebody who's unable to read facial expressions or body language, having a tool that can do that on your behalf and give you those cues would be helpful. Um, the other thing I think of is, you know, like that time I had to build that physical wall to help an employee who had ADHD kind of block out distractions. Well, a headset, a VR headset automatically can help block out distractions. So if instead of looking at a computer screen, you're looking at your work in a VR headset, you're automatically, you know, removing all the distractions in the space around you. However, conversely, if you're doing something in um, in a VR environment and it's not designed appropriately, it can be impossible to use, you know, depending on how it's built and how it's structured, some people just won't be able to use it. And then lastly, when it comes to reasoning and executive function, I can see um, XR tools being used to play through scenarios and help people figure out how to best advocate for their ideas at work or their own accommodation needs. Um, just think to help them you know, set themselves up for success because a lot of people who are neurodivergent just struggle with those communications and that like advocacy for themselves or their work. And, you know, if you're, you're trying to pitch a project to somebody, being able to play through different scenarios and how might somebody react to this um, can be useful. You could have reminders based on the environment. So if you've got your phone and you, you know, maybe scan it around the room, you could have things pop up and say, you know, a reminder being associated with a physical object, like the phone lands on the dog, don't forget to walk the dog kind of a thing um, like that. And then I could also see it being used to take advantage of people's strengths. So the some of the neurodivergent people I've managed have been the most creative and the most productive people. And I think we often forget about the strengths and the benefits of that. And I could see um, XR being used to help facilitate that because in a virtual world, you can take away all the constraints of reality. And, you know, it, for creative people being able to ideate and think through things in a way that wouldn't be possible in real life, I think could be really cool. So um, that's it. That's my experiences. And that's how I think um, XR can be used to help people who are neurodivergent in the future going forward. Oh, and I will drop my LinkedIn in the chat in case anybody wants to connect. Great. Awesome. Uh, yeah, also presentations, definitely some great ideas about how VR uh, or how to design VR experiences and um, how it can help neurodiverse users and uh, some info on what the barriers are as well. Um, so I'd like now to kind of open it up to the community. So feel free to introduce yourself and share what you're working on or uh, alternatively ask a question to any of our presenters as well. Yeah. That I was just thinking, it, you know, Kate, after what we just talked about in terms of alternate forms of communication, uh, it, it might be nice to to open up some type of whiteboard to uh, to everybody here. I don't know if we can do that easily through Zoom or um, let's say Zoom does have an embedded whiteboard feature. Whiteboard. There we go. 
Oh, Rev, look at that. Um, so yeah, I guess people feel free also to to doodle with this, to to post sticky notes. Um, I think yeah, let let's start off if if anybody has um questions for the the presenters, uh, and I'd also love to just put out um for thinking about uh, advice to content creators. You know, if you're a designer or developer, um, what have people heard that are uh, their favorite techniques that could designers and developers could use to make things more accessible. Uh, people can can unmute or type in chat just the some of the favorite ones you've you've heard so far today. I'll I'll just jump in from my own experiences because I work for Fable and we do so much testing with people with disabilities. I think um, you really do learn so much when you bring people in to do co-design. So. Um, you know, especially with neurodiversity, there's such a diversity of what people's needs are, you know, there's no one size fits all. And so engaging with like a pretty broad group of participants and figuring out what their needs are for whatever project you're working on and like getting their feedback early on as you're thinking through ideas or as you're prototyping things, um, we've seen that be very effective in uh, the web and the mobile space when it comes to accessibility. And I think it, it would be equally effective in the XR space as well. Yeah, and kind of, I guess, kind of bouncing off of that as well, when it comes to like researching how to make XR more accessible as well. One of the, one of the sort of caveats that when you start off in the neurodivergent space um, is that when you start saying, oh, I want to make uh, XR accessible with neurodivergent users, you really have such a massive user base that counts as neurodivergent, right? So you see a lot of papers that are like tagged as like neurodivergent research papers in this space, but it's like there's um, such a handful of users that could fall under it. It's anything from dyslexia and dyspraxia to autism and ADHD. Um, and it can be really hard to actually find the user base you want to work with um, or even just like recruit for just neurodivergence itself, since it's also like a term that isn't fully accepted by everyone who's in the community, right? Um, so I guess like as far as strategies go in that um, side of things, we found in our lab that um, it's it's most helpful if you kind of start with like a group that you want to work with, uh, like a specific group, like, oh, I want to work with like ADHD people, or I want to work with autistic people, or ADHD people um, who have both, uh, or I want to work with dyslexic people, um, and start with those groups as opposed to trying to start with like neurodivergent users or anyone who is neurodivergent, because that can get very out of hand and very difficult to to juggle and balance um, without even touching on the conversations that Kate was pointing out about like self-diagnosis versus medical diagnosis and all of that. Sorry, uh, the question was specifically about the process, right? Yeah. And oh, I, I I think, it. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. No, the, the good, good processes, best practices, um, and again, if, if anybody mm -hmm. here wants to to speak to uh, their own experiences, their own um, things, definitely feel free to, to speak up. Now's the time. Yeah, and then I think there's there's a question I think that's been written on the whiteboard, right? Which is what strategies do you have to solicit input from neurodiverse users, um, right? That's like a question mm -hmm. um, for us. Okay. Yeah, I mean, um, so I think, I think Kate would kind of like mentioned how um, there's there's like strategies like co-design, like you bring in these particular groups and work with them to actually develop stuff from the ground up when I guess getting a bit more granular with it when it comes to actually like soliciting specific um, feedback from those users or working with them to develop these things. Uh, what we do in our lab a lot is uh, we like to prototype. Um, so we have uh, we develop like custom VR prototypes, we develop custom VR tools and situations, um, and we try to make them like broadly customizable. So for example, we'll be able to switch up any features um, that we want to switch with the user like in session. So we can make the haptic feedback stronger, we can uh, make the audio like quieter, we can basically like alter the prototype in real time with those users based on what they're saying. And for us, we've found that that really helps to solicit input because it gives the user something to experience, like a VR experience that they can bounce off of. Um, and then they can also play around with it and then give really specific points of feedback on whatever it was that they just kind of encountered. So we really like to like prototype and edit the prototype with them in space. 
I think also one of the benefits of doing that too is that VR is still a pretty new medium for a lot of users. Um, there's a lot of people who have never tried VR before or like the first time they come into our lab, it's their first time trying VR. Uh, so having like a prototype on hand for them to actually like test out is one of our most like useful strategies to just get their input. And I can add uh, more on that. Uh, so for for example, uh, one of the options can be doing a live observation and talk. So ensure that you watch what people do, how they use the app you want to test, and then you ask questions right away. Because sometimes people don't, people forget of what they did on the app by the time they do a post-play survey. And another option can be uh, if you cannot do it live, uh, recording, ask people to record the video and then compare both recordings and uh, their survey results. And for recording, uh, as I mentioned during uh, my presentation, that it's important that the tasks tasks are not overwhelming. So either it should be one simple task or just general walkthrough to observe what people will do uh, or something simple and shouldn't be um, too long. Also, depending on the goals, uh, what we do is um, uh, people can use different goals, what they want uh, to test for. And it can be time-based. Uh, it can be specific user flows, which can be very different in terms of, in terms of time. So it's basically the opposite from time, time-based. Um, and so of course, um, since we are working on that, we, we use uh, now currently use our own tool. So the recording is automatic. So people don't need to worry about it, but to uh, prevent the cognitive overload, you can provide very detailed step-by-step -step guides on how to set things up. So people don't worry about that. Mm. And yeah, in terms of design, the best solution would be customization options. Because it's impossible to, to build uh, something, one, one app that is already accessible for everyone and as I mentioned and gave examples, how different and opposite the opinions of different um, users with different ADHD types can be. So to enable that, uh, customization is the only solution. And customizations and tests and iterations. Um, I do want yeah. to ask, are, are we allowed to put questions on the board as well? Like if we have questions for the other, like for the community at large and the other speakers? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'd say let's, let's, let's have uh, somebody, somebody from the audience uh, or not the audience. That's, that's the point. There's no audience here. It's, <laughs> it's a community discussion. Let's have somebody who hasn't, hasn't spoken yet. I'd love to, to get more voices in here. Um, please go ahead and, and uh, unmute yourself. You're free to turn on video if you like. Um, and just go ahead and, and ask a question or, or give some input because uh, we want to hear from everybody. I'd be happy to contribute some, some pieces. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, my name is Andrea. I am the executive director of Elixir Simulations. We are a not-for-profit based in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Um, our organization is dedicated to uh, the accelerating the production and adoption of immersive technology. Uh, we work primarily with post-secondaries within um, within Canada um, to to help them uh, bring in immersive technologies into their research as well as their uh, training and education. Um, 
one of the projects that uh, we recently worked on um, was a partnership between Northwest College, uh, a, a college here in Alberta, um, as well as with the government of Alberta um, on neurodivergence. Uh, so originally the it's the project was meant to be focused on employers and job seekers, um, specifically neurodivergent job seekers and providing some tools and resources to help them uh, with employability. So uh, lots of what was presented today in terms of um, accommodations and interventions um, to help support um, when they're going through an interview process or going through um, uh, onboarding at an organization. Um, so uh, there's, there's some pieces where we created some simulations where we're able to practice going through an interview in a safe space uh, and, and, and an option for it to be repeatable as well. Um, then we also created scenarios for employers um, using the the ability of virtual reality to uh, to impart empathy and understanding. I think that was a really big piece where virtual reality enables you to actually put yourself into somebody's different perspective. So uh, again, some of the, the comments that were made today, we're talking about like sensory input and designing for individuals with neurodivergence. And um, the other side of that is that we can actually help simulate potentially what it would look from their perspective um, so people can understand uh, a little bit better. So talked about time blindness and uh, time management pieces and um, even just sensory overload. So you can put someone into uh, potentially a, um, uh, an office environment and have lots of loud noises, change the, the light settings, all of these pieces. So there's the other side of it. So, so not just for creating those accommodations, but um, also then for creating empathy. Um, so that was something that we were also using the, the technology for to, to help provide understanding and, and build understanding within this too. Yeah, that that's awesome, Andrea, because uh, I know there's, there's oftentimes this idea that, oh, it's great to to train up neurodivergent people to help them mask better or help them, uh, you know, basically pretend to be neurotypical in order to not make neurotypical people uncomfortable. Um, when, you know, that's a very medical model of disability way of looking at it, right? It says, oh, there's something wrong with these people. They need to pretend, help them pretend to be normal. Um, when oftentimes it's way more, A, it's way more complex than that. And B, it's, it's just as incumbent to train people who are going to be in kind of managing or hiring roles to not dismiss people because they are neurodiverse, right? Because you lose out on a lot of uh, really talented people that way. Um, so that's, that's yeah. awesome to see coming from both sides of that. Um, I'd love to, to chat a little bit about uh, this idea of kind of supporting short-term memory in XR, uh, because I know one of the big differences for me between kind of using 2D, using my desktop and working in VR is that I, I am a, uh, if, if anybody who knows me knows I'm a, a, a compulsive note taker, right? I take notes on everything because if I don't, it just is in one ear and out the other. Um, and it's oftentimes very easy for me to do that if I'm on desktop or if I'm on my phone, you know, I swap over to my notes app, jot something down, um, go back to what I was doing. But in, in XR, that can be very difficult, right? Oftentimes you're in your social VR app. How do you, how do you both write and read from those kind of like short-term memory aids? Is there a good way to do quick note-taking, other quick memory aids in XR, and is this something that can be helped on an, on an application level, or is this something that needs to be addressed on like a system level with how hard easy it is to switch between tasks? So I'd love to, to hear some conversation on that. Yeah, it looks like there's the, like a couple of things bouncing around. Also like a new oh, yeah. question on the board as well. So just to kind of like first pop off what you posed, Dylan, and then I'll like jump around to the board one. Um, so when it comes to like memory management or memory assistance, um, that's one of the conversations that we've had with some of our participants, um, particularly our participants who 
really preferred um, what they called asynchronous socialization. So again, a lot of our work focuses on social VR, so these sorts of like live interactions. But one of the challenges that a lot of our participants had was things like remembering names of people they interacted with, remembering facts about those people, remembering preferences, where they met them. Uh, the information would kind of go in one ear and out the other, unless it was something that really like clicked with them for one reason or another. And then they felt that that was like a challenging part of being able to continue interactions with them. Uh, so some of the things we talked about for helping with that, like memory management, um, or those concerns that they had for being able to remember things about who they were talking to, um, is stuff that they would be able to use in other forms of interaction. So like if they liked to talk to people on forums, for example, they'd have a record, uh, like a written record of what the conversations were. So they would like to see in VR, for example, transcriptions um, of all the conversations that they had, uh, where they would be able to go back on those written records, just like they were in chat forums and be able to see what they talked about with someone. Um, so they could sort of like review that to remember, oh, this is where I met that person. This is what we discussed um, in our conversation. Um, some of our participants also suggested using um, things like AI. Um, so one of the many applications of AI that's like being talked about these days um, to have an AI be able to scan those transcripts and like bring out like key points about someone whenever they ran into that avatar again. So for example, they might run into the avatar and then the AI would like give them a couple bullet points about like, oh, you met here, you talked about this, this is their name. Um, just like pulling from that like big written text transcript. So anything from like them being able to kind of have an asynchronous format where they could review at their own pace what they need to remember to having the system give them like visual prompts and reminders of like key information. Those are some of the things we talked about um, with how VR could support memory um, when it came to social interactions. Um, and then just to look at this like question that we're here, that's here on the board. Um, so the no code approach to creating VR or XR simulations for clients um, from, from a clinical perspective. So I, I kind of agree um, with the, the comment that's pointing here where saying like, it depends on what your goal simulation is um, because you can create VR simulations without any code in a lot of um, like commercial VR like platforms that you have or development engines. Like for example, Unity, which is what we create a lot of our prototypes in. Um, you can approach that from a no code angle. They have a template for VR, um, for a VR app that you can just basically open up and you drag and drop um, items into the scene. And you can create a really basic VR scene from that. And it's, it's all just drag and drop. It's all a visual interface. You don't have to code anything. You just kind of like click through the settings and assign things that you want to assign and move stuff around the scene to where you want to move it. However, um, that does only create a very, you know, basic simulation. Um, so if you want to create something really like particular, if the goal of your simulation, for example, is to um, train or use haptics as some increasing measure of of reminding them about like their impulses. Like if someone's doing an impulsive action or fidgeting too much and you wanna use haptics to let buzz in their controllers to tell them they're fidgeting, like that, that's gonna require coding. You're gonna have to open up um, some C-sharp scripts if you're using Unity uh, and then like track the movement of the controllers and figure out a way to increase haptics. Um, but you can make like VR scenes and put people in VR scenes very simply using like Unity or Unreal Engine um, because they both, I believe, have like drag and drop standard templates for XR that are pretty easy to set up and use. Uh, and I think that also kind of bounces to that question right underneath of, of like good open source tools for VR development. Um, I mostly use Unity um, and Unreal Engine for most of my um, VR development. And then a couple of open source things that I've used in the past have come out of like other university labs. So I would actually recommend um, looking up um, XR research labs because a lot of them will create tools that they put open source on GitHub that they did for like previous research projects. So there's like a handful of GitHub repositories that come out of university labs all the time where they introduced a tool for a voice-based interaction system for navigating menus or an XR flying interface to allow your avatar to fly. Um, so if you kind of like just do searches for like university lab um, GitHub repositories, a lot of good open source tools for VR dev, I think come out of those. And, and I'll add, this is definitely something that's of interest. Uh, I 
had a panel uh, earlier this year at, at the Augmented World Expo um, about how AI, generative AI can make XR creation more accessible. Because, you know, if we have these amazing tools that, you know, you could do it holodeck style of just speaking an app into existence, that opens up the creation for a ton more people. Um, and I think one of the things that we try to uh, you know, support a lot of the, in a lot of the time at XR Access is this idea that we're never going to have a quality if disabled people are just content consumers. They need to be creating things as well um, in order to be able to to share their viewpoints and their their storytelling. Yeah, um, and that's also like a really really good point, and I'm glad that you brought that up too, Dylan. With like generative AI, like like Chat GPT, so. For example, if you if you're trying to like make a VR simulation and there's something like complex that you need to do in a C sharp script, G Chat GPT does know like Unity and Unreal Engine specific scripting. So like you can ask it to say like, oh, in Unity C sharp, I'm trying to make a script that does X Y Z, and it'll spit out some code for you. Now that code does not is not guaranteed to work by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but it is a good bridge, I think. Um, if you're trying to do some complex things, Gen AI can be used to kind of like spit out some good templates for code um, to help you do some more complex things uh, in VR because um, they do know like the embedded systems um, for for like Unity and Unreal coding and a lot of other things as well. Sometimes I'm very surprised by um, what Chat GPT can actually like assist me in figuring out. Um, like with different APIs I've tried, I'll pull like random APIs from the internet and um, I can ask how to use it. And it actually kind of is familiar with the code base that's behind that API. So um, Gen, a Gen AI is definitely something that can help, I think, bridge that coding gap. Thank you. And I want to add about the memory aid. So what we've seen, it might be uh, app specific, of course, but for example, uh, some apps may have chapters so people, when they have a break or come back, uh, they are asked or they are shown where they left off. Uh, and another uh, option is allowing, it's also app specific, but just having hints or uh, when, when you are pointing uh, at an object, uh, there will be on-demand option to extract information about the object or environment. So we've seen things like that. One of the things that I also, um, I'd be interested in hearing from the community on, um, if anyone has like experience with this or from the other speakers as well, is um, how do you encourage, I guess, experimentation and use of accessibility for neurodivergent users um, specifically? Because uh, like with like what Kate was talking about at the beginning of this this whole discussion, um, one of the big challenges of working with neurodivergent populations in particular is that these users don't necessarily know or identify as neurodivergent. Like they may not have a diagnosis, they may not think they're neurodivergent, even if they seem to be very much on like certain spectrums. They may not know it's something that they can ask for accommodations for. Like in in my own personal experience, for example, I didn't know until I started my actual PhD program that there are accommodations for ADHD or that it's classified even as a disability. I just thought I had ADHD and that was that. Um, I, I mentioned it to my advisor and she was like, oh, thank you for disclosing your disability to me. And I was like, that was a disclosure, what? And then she started telling me about accommodations for it. Um, so like when we're creating these technologies, how do we even let users know that they can ask for or look at accommodations and like use them? Um, especially if it's like just squirreled away in an, like an accommodations menu or an accessibility menu that they have to like open up, but might assume is just for like blind or low vision things, you know? So, yeah. Uh, I'd like to jump in. One of the things that we've done, uh, I mean, hi everybody, Josh Bankston, uh, over a decade in the XR space and helped more than 10,000 folks through their first time in, in VR. So. Uh, I have walked this path a lot of different ways in a, in a lot of different settings. Uh, one of the things that has come about somewhat recently um, is using accessories for uh, devices where they are worn on the body, being cognizant of folks being 
sensitive to what is touching what part of their body and how long their prolonged exposure. So I uh, highly recommend, uh, there's a company called Bobo VR that makes an accessory uh, for the Quest devices that allows you to remove the, the, the light shield. And so it does bring in more of the uh, surrounding environment. So it, it kind of gets rid of some of the occlusion, but that can actually be a, a beneficial thing in experiences, as well as it removes the need for the device to touch your face. And that in and of itself is a, a huge uh, boon to uh, dealing with somebody who is more strongly on the neurodivergent spectrum. Um, because it gives them more autonomy and more sense of control of what they're engaging with. Um, and it feels more of like wearing a, a, a hat than it does something that's kind of glued to uh, your the skin of your face. It also helps with makeup and sweat and other, other things along those lines. Using the, got it. So it's, so it's kind of like using, using tools or um, access technologies that aren't necessarily geared towards like neurodivergence specifically, but that, that can also be marketed as just like helpful things for like the VR user experience um, that like anyone can use and that help with a lot of different things. Yes. Gotcha. Uh, also the, the gentle guidance on experience, um, things like reminding people that they're in control, right? Uh, they can close their eyes if at any point that they're uncomfortable. Uh, reminding them to just raise their hand, give a visual cue that they need direct assistance. Um, it's it's very easy to get overwhelmed in, an, in any kind of immersive experience, whether it's purely audio driven, visual driven, whatever it may be. Um, just that subtle cue at the beginning, hey, you know, I'm here to help, or there will be an attendant somewhere in the environment. Close your eyes, raise your hand. But you, immediately it takes you out of the where you're uncomfortable and it gives us a visual cue that you need some kind of a, a hands-on assistance. And and kind of, I guess, bouncing off a little bit of that. So speaking of like cues, um, one of the things that our our participants have mentioned a lot as to like a type of cue that they really like is, is gamification. And we haven't like researched gamification too much yet in our lab specifically, but a lot of our participants have pointed us towards it. So like using gamified systems, using like quest systems as ways of reminding people to do things or as ways of like encouraging certain behaviors. Um, so I guess, does anyone have kind of like thoughts on, on that? Or has anyone like tried those types of things out as um, as an accessibility measure? And can like you say yay or nay, I guess, to that as a way of queuing reminders for accessibility? I've seen a lot of gamification models for things like physical therapy, mm -hmm. um, where you're trying to kind of encourage them to hit, hit certain things physically. It'd be interesting to see it. I know there's a lot of um, uh, like, trauma trauma therapy exposure therapy that's uh, being experimented in vr so it'd be interesting to see it there um something i put on the the whiteboard here in the upper right is the idea of like a, a setup wizard um i think you know in the same way that people boot up their device having it automatically bring up accessibility settings um and just you know run people through like do you know would you like this would you like that um and just give people a very brief tour and you know people will skip it if they don't want it but um just a brief tour of like, here's some things that could make your experience easier. Uh, I think it's a, a, a can be a good way to start things out. I can add that. Uh, so the type that uh, task based progression with an immediate reward uh, works really well. For example, it can be for a training application, the way of uh, gamifying the progression. And mostly, so from what we've seen, uh, mainly types with over-focused uh, ADHD, it was their favorite, uh, uh, I don't know, feature, um, favorite option, favorite thing uh, that they enjoyed uh, the tasks, having tasks themselves, very clear goals, because it provides, each task provides a goal and a path, what they need to do, and a reward uh, and in some cases, just having a task was a rewarding experience in itself, uh, as they shared. Um, yeah. 
this is an example. Yeah, there's there's an interesting question from the the standard side of thing. You know, we're working on um, on our metaverse standards forum uh, accessibility uh, in the metaverse group. We're working on trying to kind of nail down um, standards. And so there's a question of what what should the standards be around neurodiversity, right? Where at what point can you say, you know, do you have a checklist that says, well, if it hits this and this and this, then it is accessible to neurodiverse people. Uh, are there are there things people would would put on that list? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's that's one of the hardest questions to answer. I think with neurodivergent accessibility, yeah. because it even more so, I think, than a lot of other um, ability communities out there, it's it's such a huge spectrum, and everyone has such minute differences um, in how they experience everything, even within the same condition group. Um, I mean, like Olga had had a whole slide that was like dedicated to like different types of ADHD and all the different like preferences or similarities or differences just in yeah. those different ADHD groups. So like trying to come up with a standard for like neurodivergent accessibility itself can be really challenging. I think um, a good approach maybe towards like trying to start standards is to sort of look at problem areas of overlap between lots of different groups. So for example, lots of different groups have challenges with sensory overload or sensory sensitivity. Um, lots of different groups have challenges with, um, I think Kate had called it uh, communication earlier. So anything from speech processing to speech formation to um, just like interpreting social cues. So kind of like looking at like these larger problem areas and then making sure that there are supports for different potential um, individual challenges people might have under those problem areas might be like a good way to start with standards. So for example, you could have a set of sensory sensitivity standards that ensure that all sensory aspects of VR, haptics, um, visuals, audio, et cetera, can be customized to a certain degree, whatever degree that might be, um, so that individuals can kind of make that sensory access accessible. Um, same with like the the communication aspect. So um, we don't know what specific communication problems people will have, but maybe there will be a set of different features that um, you can kind of make sure that they're customizable to certain degrees um, for how much speech support there is or how making sure there's transcription options for processing and vocalization options for formation and, and stuff like that. So I think it's, it's hard to approach and try to create standards for it, but my suggestion off the top of my head would be to approach it by looking at the larger problem areas um, and then just trying to make sure that there's like ranges of customization under those problem areas that can fit um, different uh, issues in that section. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I totally agree. And uh, I want to mention that uh, because a lot of um, disabilities or that it's not necessarily disability, it can be a, um, a temporary need as well uh, because a lot of um, needs overlap, like for example, contrast uh, mode for low vision uh, users uh, will also work uh, great and it would be a great solution for people with ADHD. So we don't uh, have specific options, uh, standards for HD in itself, but we, so this is what we do, yeah, that's why I mentioned that there are different types of ADHD. And while uh, it might be hard to identify them yourself if you're testing yourself, uh, but through different behaviors and uh, asking specific questions, you can find out what type of ADHD uh, the person has and tailor uh, and standardize based on that and create uh, yeah, group group users uh, when you do testing uh, based on their experiences. Because yeah, most of the people, uh, the majority, I would say, or it's very rare when people self-identify that uh, I have over-focused ADHD. I don't think uh, usually people don't even know some, you know, that they have ADHD and 
the the uh, type. I don't think we've uh, exper experienced uh, or we've we've met people who who know that, but we were able to identify by asking specific questions and uh, observing their behavior. So that's. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. that's good because it's you know you don't want to be put yourself in the position of trying to be armchair psychologist to, to help yeah. you out right you just want to make yeah. sure that you have different things that can support them uh no matter what right yeah exactly and asking specific questions and observing yeah like for, for example if a person uh over focused uh they tend to spend a lot of time on the task they are easily uh, so there are just very obvious correlations, and especially it's easier to see when you have larger panel of participants that they start uh, to repeat. So it's easier then it's easier to to group and understand better. But again, because a lot of things overlap, and not only among or neurodivergent users, but also in in general, uh, with other accessibility. Uh, settings or types um, customization is the best uh, solution and just ensuring that yeah this customization customization works for this group this customization is great for this group that's um, the solution absolutely all right well i think we're just about at time here um but i want to very much thank everybody for coming. I uh, really encourage you to uh, everyone to join um, our extra access Slack uh, if you'd like to to kind of continue these conversations. Uh, I put the, the link in the chat there. It's, it's extraaccess.org slash Slack. Um, we also have some great resources and I'll be adding a few of these to it, uh, to the XRA and extra access GitHub. Um, and this uh, conversation, this recording, uh, as well as uh, our chat and the uh, whiteboard here will all be shared uh, on the Extra Access website uh, very soon. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Pierce, uh, any any last words? And I think we have one or two, we, a few of us can stick around a little bit here just to, to keep talking, but. No, that was great. Thanks everyone for uh, coming today. Thank you everyone. Yes, thank everyone. you all so much. Thank you all. Thanks very much everybody. <laughs>